Welcome to the Pretty Good Policy for Crypto podcast, where we have in-depth discussions on cryptocurrency policy and regulation. I'm Paul Brickner, Head of U.S. Policy and Strategic Advocacy at The Electric Coin Company. In a few moments, I will be joined by Ron Hammond, Director of Government Relations at the Blockchain Association. We believe in fostering an inclusive and respectful environment for our discussions. And while we, Electric Coin Company, hold strong opinions on the need for private and confidential financial transactions in crypto to promote economic freedom, our guests may have differing views. Through these thought-provoking and at times challenging conversations, we aim to deepen our understanding of complex policy and regulatory issues and work towards the development of pretty good policy for the cryptocurrency world. This podcast is for educational purposes only and is not legal or financial advice. Our guests' remarks may not reflect the views of their organization or of Electric Coin Company. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Thanks for tuning in. It is my pleasure to welcome our special guest, Ron Hammond, the Director of Government Relations at the Blockchain Association. With a robust background in politics, policy, and finance, Ron has focused his career on navigating the intersection of cryptocurrency and regulatory frameworks to foster an environment that supports innovation and protects individual rights. Before joining the Blockchain Association, Ron served as the Financial Services Policy Lead for Representative Warren Davidson, where he authored the Token Taxonomy Act. He also worked as a campaign manager for the Texas State Senate races, further enhancing his political expertise. The Blockchain Association, headquartered in Washington, D.C., is a leading nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing the digital asset economy by promoting collaboration between its members and policymakers. With a focus on creating a pro innovation policy environment, the Blockchain Association works tirelessly to represent and advocate for the interests of the blockchain and cryptocurrency industries in the United States. By engaging with regulators, policymakers, and other stakeholders, the organization plays a critical role in shaping the future of blockchain and cryptocurrency. Ron has a BA from Georgetown University, which laid the foundation for his career in politics and policy. His expertise in the legislative and regulatory spheres has provided him with valuable insights into the challenges and opportunities facing the blockchain and cryptocurrency industries. As the Director of Government Relations at the Blockchain Association, Ron applies his unique blend of policy expertise, political acumen, and passion for innovation to drive meaningful progress in the rapidly evolving world of digital assets. Ron, thank you for joining us on the Pretty Good Policy for Crypto podcast. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm really excited to be on this podcast. I've seen a lot of great uh, entries before, so I'm excited to be included in this and honestly honored. So thanks again for having me. You have a very special view here to share, and that is a special insight into what's happening on Capitol Hill. You were there, I think, all morning already, and you were attending a hearing. So that's a great place to start, I think. Why don't you tell us about the hearing you attended and the environment that is currently on the Hill? Yeah, sure thing. So um, for those who may or may not know, um, today there was the stablecoin hearing. And actually, of all things, it followed up the very high-profile Gary Gensler uh, hearing as well that was in the House Financial Services Committee. So today's hearing on stablecoins was about legislation. And for me, it's dear and dear because legislation in crypto is something that has been uh, a, you know, very hard, obviously, to come by these days. But in this case, it's a bipartisan product. And that's something we've been striving for for candidly years. Uh, and I worked on bipartisan legislation before, back in my time as a Hill staffer. But now we're working on, focusing on nuanced uh, issues like stablecoins. These are things that are very important for the ecosystem. They combine the worlds of TradFi and crypto. And in a way that members of Congress on both sides of the aisle were able to engage on in a pretty substantive manner. And I think that's a huge thing that I've seen personally is the amount of engagement that happened in that hearing today that was substantive. There's a legislative text behind the bill uh, or behind the hearing. But at the same time, there's also a lot of questions that still have to be answered. And this hearing, uh, there were folks like Jake Travinsky from the Blockchain Association, Adrian Harris from the NYDFS, uh, Donna Disparte from Circle, and others that provide some very meaningful feedback to both members of Congress on either side of the aisle. And I think it's a really good um, you know, showcase that A, Congress is educated, B, stablecoins is moving, and C, this is a very substantive hearing. This wasn't about politics. This wasn't about my side versus your side. 
there's a very much of let's actually solve an issue here. And I think that's an awesome thing about crypto policy is that there are real issues here and it's not for the faint of heart. If you work in crypto policy, you are here to get stuff done. It is very difficult to understand. It's a lot easier to go on social media and blast the other side of the aisle. But the members who came, came to the uh, digital assets subcommittee are here to solve problems. And that was what's evident today. That's great news. And I, we have a bill, right? We have a bill that is being considered. That's the same bill or a very similar bill to what was introduced before, correct? Correct. It's a draft bill right now. So uh, there's a lot of things that can change, and I believe they will change over time. Um, but for those who may not know behind the scenes, this draft bill has been uh, actually a reemergence of a 2022 draft. Uh, and we were in the middle of the, the negotiations, but also just the understanding for policymakers back in 2022 in the fall of what does stablecoin regulation look like? Uh, so it's been really exciting to see that product come finally to light because he's put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, both at the Blockchain Association, but also just educating members of Congress and the staff on the issue area itself. Um, so it's really evident that A, the staff and members are educated. B, there's still a couple unresolved issues, basically on the state versus federal regulators, you know, what the roles are. Um, but finally, also, there is progress to be made. And I think that's a good sign that, hey, we're having very in-depth conversations. And this political climate, it's always easier just to blast the other side or to play politics. But here we saw a very substantive, we want to get something done. And I'm walking away encouraged. I'm sure the headlines will say that there is still a lot to be done. But that's okay. That's what uh, you know a good finished product looks like. And that's what, uh, you know, we came here to tackle tough subjects. And that's what I'm here for. Yes, I think that in particular, the stablecoin draft legislation is going to be difficult from what I understand. I've I read a lot of articles going up to this hearing, and they weren't very optimistic. But you seem to have a little bit different view coming out of the hearing. Well, I consider myself an optimist, honestly, so maybe uh, I take my view with a grain of salt. But at the same time, you know, Congress introduces over 6,000 bills a year in each chamber. So the idea that any of those bills get through is about 99% chance they all die. So we're talking about a 1% chance that any bill of any kind, of any caliber, has any chance of moving. And I put the stablecoin bill in that 1% camp right now, because there's still a lot of force at play. And I think the important thing, at least from a political perspective, is that you have the buy-in from the lead Republican, Patrick McHenry from North Carolina, and the lead Democrat, Maxine Waters in California. When you have those two power players involved in legislation, no matter what it is, that gives credence to it automatically. Sure, there are going to be some folks uh, on both camps say, hey, look, I have holdups on this side or on this side. But that's what policy making is, and that's what negotiating is. And I think it's great to see both camps say, here's a marker, we're going to start from this marker and we're going to move forward. You know, policy takes a long time. I know folks uh, in the crypto community especially are wondering what takes so long. Uh, but again, I want to reiterate, 6,000 bills and only a fraction of those pass each year. And this is one of those bills that is substantive, it's tailored, and it's balanced. And I think that's, you know, it's, industry did not get everything they wanted. The consumer protection groups didn't get everything they wanted. Republicans didn't get what they wanted uh, entirely. Same with the Democrats. But you know what? That's what a uh, product looks like. It looks like a negotiation that happens. And I think we're seeing that come together right now. Still a long way to go, but I'm really uh, excited the prospects. And that's a, a first. For someone who, who uh, spearheaded crypto legislation, I will say this is the most substantive as well as most uh, uh, longevity-wise has a chance to actually move. Okay, well, that's great. So you say it is a long road ahead. What do you think we should be looking forward to for this specific draft legislation on stable coins? So for any bill to have a vote in the committee, it needs to have a hearing. And that's what this hearing was. This hearing was, dear Republicans and Democrats, we are putting a draft out here for the public. Again, this draft was back in the fall of 2022. It's had some changes uh, over quite some time, actually, in the past couple of months. But this is an older draft and says, you know what, we're going to start here and we're going to move forward. And right out of the gate, we saw uh, Maxine Waters, uh, the lead Democrat, say, I have concerns about this bill. And I know from the Republican side, they have concerns about the bill as well. But there is an understanding that uh, both sides uh, and both camps are going to have to make some negotiations here. And I think that's what it, the important part is. You know, right now, the hold of is, you know, what's the role of state regulators? Uh, does the NYDFS, for example, Adrian Harris was one of the actual folks who testified that hearing, who is the superintendent of the NYDFS. She said, look, I believe my state and my agency does a really good job of regulating stable coins. Now, some folks on the Democrat side say, I don't think the state should have a role here. Some of the Republicans say, I think states should be the only ones who have a role here. 
And I think we're going to see something more in the middle. We have the states have a role to play here. The federal regulators, though, do have a role to play in saying, dear states, there's some uh, you know, ideas of uh, what regulations should look like. You should uh, you know, abide by these rules. We don't want to have a situation where one state uh, is just a free and open market in terms of uh, easy access. Anyone can establish a stable coin and then they rug pull folks later on. So we need to make sure we have some, at least uh, an idea of what a framework looks like, what's comprehensive, but also we make sure we trust the states here as well. And I think the NYDFS has a pretty good track record, especially in stable coins, of what that looks like. So uh, there's still, again, like I said, a long way to go. These negotiations will take some time, but I, I could be potentially in the summer we have a, a vote, at least in the House, on a stable coin bill. Thanks for the optimistic outlook there. Were there other topics that were brought up related to stable coins, for example, CBDCs? I didn't get a chance to watch it myself because I was at, a, at another meeting this morning. Uh, well, hey, that meeting was a very important meeting as well. So let's uh, let's not forget that too. But no, CBDCs actually, and, and I think that's actually important. They didn't come up in this conversation. Um, you know, right now, uh, I think more on the Republican side of the aisle, actually, I think it's actually happening on the presidential Republican side of the aisle. We are seeing CBDCs become a, a mainstream issue. Uh no, I think it's a combination of mistrust in government from COVID. I think it's also a issue of uh, privacy concerns and also what we're seeing in China with a digital yuan, for example. A lot of Republican and Republican presidential candidates, most notably Ron DeSantis, are really grasping to the CBDC and the issue that this is uh, going to be the end of privacy. This can be the end of um, uh, sur- you know, this is be a surveillance tool for citizens. And they have some rightful concerns, candidly, on this approach. Um, but at the same time, that conversation is not the same conversation as stablecoins. These are two different entities here. And sometimes in Congress, it's easier to bleed into other policy realms to serve your political purpose, uh, whether it be for talking points or media hits or what have you. But in this conversation, in this hearing in particular, is a really substantive hearing. And I think it's actually really uh, relieving, Kelly, on my part, because we saw a legislative hearing that focused on the legislation, not talking points, not saying that that side of the aisle is bad or that party's bad or uh, what have you. This was a substantive hearing, and I was really relieved to see that this conversation was about stable coins, not central bank digital currencies. I'm glad to hear that too. I'm glad it was very focused and staying right on topic. It's rare for Congress to stay on topic. So like, let's also just appreciate the Congress staying on topic. That's a very important thing too. And this is the first hearing in the subcommittee, correct? Uh, actually, second uh, hearing. Uh, second hearing. Uh, ironically, the first hearing was uh, on my birthday. It seems like March 9th is always the important day in crypto policy. If you recall, last year it was the executive order um, on digital assets was on March 9th. And then this year was the reviewing of the uh, Biden administration's policies towards crypto, which was pretty critical. But we saw criticism from Republicans and Democrats and pretty rare for Democrats to attack their own. Um, and I think that was really... Uh, eye-opening to see folks like Richie Torres, Josh Gottheimer, and others, both at that hearing as well as the Gensler hearing yesterday, really attacking their own party. Again, I want to highlight, that's a really rare thing. So to see them being critical because of a technology or an industry uh, in the crosshairs and saying, look, I am going to be politically unpopular to defend this segment or to defend this technology, that's huge. Um, And I think we should really celebrate those folks who take what's less politically uh, favorable and stand for what's right. So I think we should really, you know, congratulate those uh, folks like Richie Torres and Josh Gottheimer and uh, Wally Nickel for really stepping out and saying, I believe in this technology. I'm going to do what's politically unfavorable. Thanks for reminding me of that earlier hearing. I remember that now, uh, which was really interesting. And the point you bring up about some of the people in the party attacking what's happening there is, is interesting to me. And I think it happened yesterday, too, a little bit in uh, the uh, um, oversight hearing. Can you talk about that and all the dynamics that occurred in that hearing yesterday? Because that was pretty fascinating. Oh my gosh, tell me about it. Um, Gary Gensler, as for those who may not know, he testified in front of the House Finance Service Committee. And while the House Finance Service Committee oversees the SEC, and that's very, you know, it's routine for them to do an oversight hearing. It's pretty rare that we've had such a long gap between the last time you uh, appeared for the committee which is October 5th, 2021. So think about just for the crypto space, Terra, FTX, Celsius, so much has happened in 2022, um, let alone all financial markets. So much has happened and let alone what was the one dominant policy issue in that entire hearing on both sides of the aisle was crypto. Um, and for me, the, uh, the Hill Stafford 2017, who 
fought and uh, cried out so much to, for folks that care about crypto, and it was more largely dismissed. To see that six years later and say, look, SEC chair, we are focusing entirely on crypto, not entirely, but largely on crypto from Democrats and Republicans. You had Democrats attacking Democrats about their approach to crypto. That's huge. And I think that's, A, also important to show that Congress has come a long way in education. Most of these guys, the, uh, you know, years ago, could not know how a website ran. They didn't know what Bitcoin was. They thought it was all money laundering. Um, yeah, I, they made a joke. I was a Hill staffer that I worked for uh, Congress and Crypto, Warren Davidson, and they called me Captain Crypto because they knew we would always talk about crypto. And the, the, the jokes I received six years ago, and it was all in jest. They were, they were all my friends. So it was, I was always teased a little bit like, oh, let me guess, you're going to be focused on crypto. No one really cares about that. And then if I told them, hey, guess what? In six years, when the SEC chair comes in, the biggest hearing potentially of the year, and guess what? Half of your uh, members of Congress you uh, as staffers represent are going to be talking about crypto, they would have laughed me out of the room. Largely, they already did before that. So it's funny to see the whole turnaround. But again, I want to highlight the importance of Democrat attacking Democrats because of crypto. That's huge. You don't see that too often. The Democrats attacking their own party. I hate to see it, actually, because I, I, I would like for all Democrats to and all Republicans to appreciate crypto. So I don't want to see any party have infighting about crypto. It, it should be something that we can all support. Exactly. But at the same time, when the folks you know are are attacking the technology uh, who are supposed to be technology neutral. You know, for me personally, it was, there was a, uh, Gary Gensler test, or he did a interview actually with New York Magazine. And the interviewer recently asked him, who are crypto do you respect? And then in literally in the transcript goes, the Gary Gensler, the SE chair goes, next question. He just passes it off. Wow. And that's, for me, that was, that, that rubbed me the wrong way in particular because it's one thing to, you know, to attack certain companies and that's fine. And especially in crypto, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of stuff to attack crypto on. There's a lot of fraud and scammers, and there's a lot of reasons to say, look, these are bad actors, screw them. But when you talk about the entire industry, some of the smartest people in the world work in this space. And to outright dismiss it as a technology neutral regulator, I bet if you asked him, you know, hey, who do you expect in banking or in private equity? Uh, he would give you an answer. But to outright dismiss the entire industry and all those who work in it, that was disheartening. Uh, I, I, I don't get enough airtime in the New York Magazine article, but for me personally, that was a very much a, a sign that, hey, here's someone who is taking an aggressive stance. And I think it's okay to, to, attack, um, to attack that stance. If he's going to be uh, against uh, or not technology neutral, then it's, I think it's full fair to attack him for that. So uh, we saw that from Democrats. We definitely saw that from Republicans. Um, but uh, it's very obvious the SEC chair is not uh, technology neutral. He's against this industry. His actions say so, and his unfortunately, his words say so as well. That's unfortunate. I did watch that yesterday, at least a good part of it. And uh, the part that really jumped out at me was the grilling that he received on trying to uh, nail him down to about Ether, whether Ether was a security or commodity. Any other things like that, or do you want to elaborate on that moment? I love that here or that, that line of questioning. It was the first question right off the bat. Simple question. What is Ethereum? We've known for a little bit that back in was uh, the uh, the Gary Plastic speech, the, the speech that Bill Hinman, the uh, former director of Corp Fins, uh, made a speech and said that, again, Ethereum by this speech is not a security. Um, which let's also take a step back and say, you know, in crypto, it's amazing that we don't go by regulation. You no, know, there's regulation by enforcement, but even then there's also regulation by speeches. So every single speech. As an industry, we have to watch and hope and see what token is going to be classified as a commodity or a security because it's important because we don't have proper rulemaking. So like, let's, that's a huge issue to begin with. But moving forward, we had you know, a lot of folks from the Blockchain Association and others uh, that I met with uh, as a Hill staffer and now on the other side saying, we go to the SEC, we ask questions, and we get no clarity. And I think Patrick McHenry did a great job just showcasing the absurdity of what those meetings look like in a public setting. It's a simple question, security or commodity? Please tell me what it is. And he would not answer that. And I remember seeing it just going back and forth three times, still wouldn't give an answer. And I just think about all those companies who spent thousands, millions of dollars going to the SEC, prepping for these meetings, waiting to get some clarity. And they get that runaround but behind closed doors. 
And it took Patrick McHenry to bring that into a public setting and bring it to light just to showcase the ridiculousness of what the current SE regime is like. Uh, I know we've we've heard about this for for years, but to see that in person is it's damning, but also candidly, it's disheartening. Uh, and that's just the current regime is that there's a person who has this view, and he's very set in his ways. And that person, that bureaucrat, is currently running the SEC, and that's what uh, his view is the law. And that's uh, a very tough situation, especially when the answer is not even clear. It's just this opaque, well, here's some facts and circumstances, and you are supposed to make the determination, oh, by the way, I'm not going to tell you exactly, but I'm going to come at you if you make the wrong decision in my mind, which seems to be evolving a little bit too. So that's been really unfortunate. I mean, he's been telegraphing Ethereum for a little bit. Um, in the past two years, he throws the word in maybe a commodity, maybe a commodity, maybe likely a security. He throws these adjectives in it. So we've been seeing it telegraph for about two years now since he's taken over. Uh, but it took Patrick McHenry to bring it out to light to show the entire world, unfortunately, that Ethereum in the Clayton administration, which was deemed, again, a commodity, is not the same as uh, the against administration. So that's what we're dealing with, unfortunately, right now. Extremely frustrating and um, hard for the industry to deal with. Um, so I guess the only way to fix that is to come up with good legislation that really provides clarity, which is a good segue to the next topic in that we do have legislation that's being drafted. I don't think the draft has been released, but maybe you can tell me otherwise. I, I heard this morning that, that it's imminent, that we will have a draft bill from Senators Lummis and Gillibrand coming out very soon. And of course, this is not their first take at it. They've been at it in, in the past. So they've had a chance to refine it and hopefully produce something that will have some traction. What do you think about that? Yes. Uh, Senator Lummis from Wyoming and Senator Gillibrand from New York are have been absolute godsends. But also, I want to highlight there's uh, other folks in the Senate, as well as Republicans and Democrats, who've been super solid on these issues, like Senator Haggerty from Tennessee, Senator Sinema from Arizona. You know, we have champions on both sides of the aisle. So the upside is that A, crypto, as we all know, is a bipartisan issue. And so I think it's really important that the Lummis Gillibrand is that bull weather marker that not only the House cares about these issues, the Senate does. Um, well, the Token Taxonomy Act, the bill I worked on with Warren Davidson, was sort of the first bipartisan crypto legislation in financial services for Republicans, for Democrats. How do you regulate crypto, securities, banking, tax law? The Lummis Shillibrand bill is that version, but in the Senate, and a lot more comprehensive candidly, it covers DAOs and other major issues that um, have been uh, part of the unregulatory certainty that's been happening right now in the United States. And so the Lummis Shillibrand bill is a huge marker. Uh, at the same time, too, it takes a lot to get move any piece of legislation, let alone crypto, in this uh, you know, day and age. And so I think we'll see that bill probably more narrowed down the road, uh, maybe more along the lines of stable coins or more market structure. But the upside is that we see two very uh, legitimate senators who have respected their respective caucuses working on a bill that has bipartisan support, that has buy-in from um, both folks in the House as well as um, other folks in the states, uh, regulators and agencies. And it's very, again, comprehensive. Um, again, comprehensive legislation usually gets narrowed down, but I think it's a really good bill to have something like that and to have thought leaders like Senator Lummis and Senator Gillibrand saying, we're here to tackle tough issues, and we're not here to tackle like, you know, one segment of the market. We're here to tackle all of it. Um, and again, politically, we're going to probably narrow it in, but it takes a lot of work to get to that point. These are tough questions. And again, I like to, you know, as someone who used to be in the situation of writing legislation, there's no roadmap. This is a brand new topic. This is a you know uh, a brand new frontier in policy. That's pretty rare. You don't have uh, too often a whole new area where there's not you know party lines uh, in the place, or we have industries here, or regulators are here, or consumer protection groups are here. It's pretty brand new, and so to take on that responsibility as uh, center uh, and staff. Is tough, and that needs to be commended. And I think that's why Senator Lovis and Senator Gillibrand have the respect of the respective caucuses. So it's really exciting to see, uh, and I'm excited to see what happens after uh, that bill gets introduced. I want to pick up on something you mentioned there, in that you suggested parts of the Token Taxonomy Act have been included into this, perhaps. And I think that's an important point about how legislation goes through Congress and is developed in Congress, and that it takes perhaps many introductions over a course of many sessions of Congress for a bill to actually get to the point where it's ready 
to move and then perhaps narrow it as you suggest. But uh, since you mentioned the, the Token Taxonomy Act, I want to get into that a little bit. Tell us about your experience with that and then tell us about how it's evolved and you know where what remains of it and what, what it's doing in the current proposals. I first want to say, uh, as much I, I love to say that the Token Taxonomy Act was the basis for um, the Lummis Shillaprand and a lot of the elements were. Actually, the Token Taxonomy Act was based off another bill that came from actually uh, David Schweiker from Arizona and Jared Polis, who is now the governor of Colorado. So another bipartisan duo here. It was actually the tax section I really borrowed a lot of the basis from. Uh, it was 20, I believe it was 2014 bill, uh, with the idea of what's de minimis tax uh, status for crypto. Um, and so I looked at that bill and said, you know, this is a very good bipartisan basis for for crypto. You know, it's a very simple question. How do you tax crypto? Uh, you know, and what's the de minimis tax uh, status? And of course, the, the first people I go to was Coin Center. Um, but, you know, taking a step back to where this all came from, uh, in Congress, they operate kind of like a high school where the idea that every single member has their lane. And so when Warren Davidson, I was his uh, third employee when he took over for John Boehner when he retired. So I came from Pete Olson, a member from Texas, who's now retired. I moved over to uh, Warren Davidson's office and I became his financial services staffer. And I really wanted to work on financial services policy, not necessarily crypto. I actually didn't know too much about crypto. Um, my, you know, we heard in the media through Silk Road and like all those stories about Bitcoin stuff. I wasn't really too involved in, in crypto at the time. Um, but Warren Davidson at the time realized as a new member of Congress, he wanted to work on capital formation. He wanted to work on emerging technologies and capital formation, not necessarily crypto. This is 2017, early part of the ICO boom. And at the time, Senate banking chair Mike Crapo from Idaho says, you know, Venture capital issues are taken care of. We have members for that. Ironically, French Hill, who's now this subcommittee chair for digital assets, um, we'll find you an issue. Um, you know, why don't you look at this crypto issue? And then Warren Davidson looks over at me and goes, why don't you look at this crypto issue, Ron? And that's what staff do. And said, you know what? Yes, sir, I will. And that became a hard, a long process of like get, understanding what the space is, who are the players, what are the issues, and what do we need to solve? And what I came to realize is that this is a really tough issue. I mean, I'm not telling anyone it's like really shocking, but crypto is tough. In 2017, it was even more opaque. The only groups out there that were educating folks was Coin Center. And God bless them, because I would not be where I am today without Coin Center. Um, but I decided to do an inverse hearing. Instead of having a situation where you have 50 members of Congress listening to three people who are policy experts, I wanted to inverse that. I wanted to have uh, five members of Congress listening to 50 experts uh, in the industry, ranging the gambit. So I organized um, this uh, series called Regulating uh, Digital Assets. And uh, it was a series that happened to the Library of Congress in October of 2018. And the idea is that we literally had the inverse hearing where we had 50 members surrounding five members of Congress who were on a little pedestal in a room. We broke down three groups. We had NASDAQ, Coin Center, um, now the blockchain association was actually founded that day. Um, we had, uh, the folks from Mazari, uh, Bittrex, uh, Coinbase, and we ranged the gambit. Caitlin Long was there. There's a huge variety of folks who were there from them, but the idea was no regulators. We wanted to hear from the industry. What are your concerns? And it was, it was a bipartisan panel of folks listening. And that's what became the token taxonomy act. It was that we listened to the industry. We worked together with, uh, them as well as folks on the regulatory side and decide what makes sense for a bipartisan bill to be a marker here. And we got four Republicans and four Democrats to join that effort. And mind you, as someone who's not a lawyer, took a lot of effort, took a lot of uh, 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 analysis, it took a lot of leaning on legal experts. It wasn't perfect by any means. Like I definitely had a lot of folks in the crypto space who were saying this it's flawed for this definition, this definition. But the idea was, look, let's put this bill out here. I want to hear from folks and let's move forward. And um, I was really proud of the effort of Candle Labor. September 2018, it's CNBC live stream it, and it got a lot of good press, but uh, I'm still proud of that uh, actual effort because it was pretty unique, it was rare, and it was something that I just did all on my own. And I'm really proud that that led to legislation. I think that's how it should be. I think we should have um, you know, folks from nonprofits, from think tanks, from industry to come together to come up with good legislation. Not necessarily, you know, it's a gimme to all industry or a gimme to the consumer groups. We should bring every stakeholder together. Uh, and that's what the Token Taxonomy Act was. 
on the point of bringing all the stakeholders together. That is exactly what we try to do with the PGP for Crypto Breakfast, with this podcast, and, and with really everything we do. We try to incorporate all these different perspectives that end up with a very good result. And I appreciate that you innovated in Congress, which is probably one of the hardest places to innovate and in, in, that I could imagine. So that's that's impressive. It wasn't easy, but uh, I'm, that's why uh, I'm still I'm proud of it. Even though it was one event, I was it was very awesome to bring, again, so many from the industry into the Library of Congress. The, the venue was awesome. So uh, venue was awesome. The conversation was great. Six hours. You don't get members of Congress to give six hours of their time, especially in 2018 when, candidly, five of the six members, uh, four of the five members probably just did not know too much about crypto. But six hours in a closed setting, it's pretty rare. And again, the, also the caliber of, of participants was so massive. And that's what really brought the good conversation there. So a lot's happened since, but uh, I'm still proud that really uh, that one moment. I think I can now understand that I can give you credit for making Representative Davidson such a champion for the industry. He is just incredible. I did have a chance to spend time with him. He, he is so knowledgeable and not just at a high level. He knows very technical details about Zcash, for example, and other cryptocurrencies that really shocked me. I mean, I wish I could take credit for that. I literally was keeping up with him the entire time. That man is a, a West Point grad, Army Ranger, smart as hell. Um, actually, ironically, it's actually funny you mentioned him today because after the hearing today in financial services, I chatted with him uh, for a while and his staffer, Tim Height, who replaced me, he's a great guy too. Uh, he, uh, Warren Davidson says, you know, we got to make sure we protect uh, privacy coins. got to make sure we protect DeFi. You know, I'm not sure if some of the, the folks um, on either side can fully agree with me here, but you know what? Uh, this is really important. Uh, he says Zcash actually in particular is like, we got to make sure this is the future. I believe in this and I want to make sure we keep this innovation here. Um, and it was, it was, it was funny. Cause I was like, you know, of all things, I'm actually going to go on their podcast today. And he's like, well, please let them know. I say hi. So, Warren Davidson says hi, by the way. That is so cool. You just made my day, probably my month. That was <laughs> That's exactly what I needed to He's hear. He's a great guy, so. Thank you so much for, for relaying that message. We, we've got to get him on the podcast. You really should. He's a fan. He's. I mean, this is right up his alley, so he, he'll do He's, so well. He's my personal hero. He really is. So we talked about a little bit of what hopefully will come through the Lemus Gillibrand bill very soon, and... Um, I guess we also have some major threats out there on the legislation front too, right? And we need to, to cover both sides. What is the threat that you see right now? I understand that there's a, a bill that's coming forward from Senator Warren and, and Marshall. So can you tell me about that? Yeah, actually, uh, speaking of timing too, on my way actually in the Uber here, I got a, an email from the staffer at Marshall's office of the, the latest draft. Um, so still reviewing it to see the, the edits here, but uh, first off, again, appreciate the Marshall staff for being candid. You know, it's not easy to share with the opposition, um, but I do appreciate him um, for being candid. That's what, you know, good staff do. So I first off want to say thank you to the bill over there. Thank you very much. Um, but the bill itself is definitely an issue for crypto. There's definitely uh, a lot of threats in terms of KYCing every single transaction that interacts with the blockchain. Um, you know, I think the issue sometimes with the crypto ecosystem in DC is that the terminology sometimes just... Um, you know, members of Congress or staff think one thing, largely members of Congress, and then the industry uh, has another view. So, you know, things like crypto mining. The amount of times I had to explain to members of Congress, no, sorry, they're not actually digging into the earth for mining. But it's like, oh, okay. So transactions. Uh, folks think, you know, blockchain transactions involve financial transactions every single time. But we all know that's not the case. You know, transactions on the blockchain are very different. There's, you know, there's data sets that get uh, updated and many other things. But for folks, at least, unfortunately, in the Warren office, they think that there's so much money laundering crypto because they see these stories uh, in the press of North Korea, of Iran using it to evade sanctions or to fund their nuclear programs. Um, but the reality is that they hear these stories because we found them through the blockchain. The transparency of the blockchain allows us to see that North Korea is utilizing this, that Iran is trying to use it for sanctions evasion. And that's why we go after bad actors like Bitslotto and other uh, Hydra and other exchanges and bad actors here. When it comes to the traditional financial system, which, by the way, is 4% uh, or so uh, is illicit finance, we don't know about that illicit finance because it's hidden. It's opaque. That's not what crypto is about. And we only discover what the transact or these uh, you know, illicit uh, transactions are through things like the Panama Papers, um, because 
we need leaks like this to showcase the illicit finance in the traditional system is so vast. And so I think it's more of a media narrative, but also just what they're grasping onto is just the headlines, is that these senators, these older senators uh, are saying, look, I think there's so much money laundering crypto, I need to, you know, to make sure that this stops. Good intentions, but at the same time, their proposed solution is to crack down on every single transaction in the blockchain and provide KYC AML requirements, which would literally slow down the entire thing to a halt. So it's incompatible with what the technology is. And at the same time, I think it's just based off wrong fears of what they're seeing in the media. Because again, these stories that come out on crypto money laundering, it's because they found it. Whereas in the case of the illicit finance and traditional system, they usually don't find it. Um, and so I hope we can improve on that. I think the bill is going to probably drop next week, unfortunately. Um, but already we've seen champions uh, like Byron Dawes, for example, from Florida. He did a great interview the other day on thinking crypto. He said, look, this is a huge threat to privacy. This, if this bill were to be passed, it would A, kill the crypto markets, but B, it would be a huge threat to privacy for United States citizens. And I think that's a huge thing to highlight is that we have good champions on the Republican side of the aisle who are going against their own, again, calling out Republicans, calling out Republicans, pretty rare, saying this is the wrong approach. We should definitely not do that, uh, Senator Marshall. Um, my fear is that, uh, which has been happening in crypto, is that we know crypto is not a partisan issue, but it definitely breaks down along the lines of age, where we have the older, again, in the Senate, typically is older. We have these older folks saying, I don't trust this. I don't like this. Let's write it off. And we have the younger folks uh, in Congress, progressive, conservative, moderate, saying, we should embrace this. That's not how, you know, crypto works. So let me tell you why this is actually a pretty bad thing to launder money with. Uh, and that's why criminals largely aren't using it. I think we really need to dig into some of that in, in a little more depth. I want to make it very clear that when we say that this bill is a threat, it's not because we are pro illicit finance. Like it's not because we're trying to uh, avoid KYC or we're trying to make it easier for money launderers. That's that's not the reason why we would say it's a threat. We would say it's a threat because it has the potential to prevent even peer-to-peer -peer transactions, right? It's not about intermediated transactions that are currently going on, and they're going on with AML and KYC uh, um, measures that are that are applied to those through the intermediaries, right? So it's the, it's the next step that we're concerned with. Yeah. And, and I say the Blockchain Association, we're all for parity. It's like, no, we're asking for special rules or anything like that saying, well, you know, crypto deserves this uh, exemption because it's crypto. No, in this case, we're saying, look, in the case, like the equivalent of this would be if I send you $5, if I just give you a $5 cash right now, in this situation, I would have to perform KYC AML. That doesn't make sense. And we don't do that, obviously, in, uh, for cash. So why do we need to apply these extra stringent rules on the crypto side of things for something like that? It, there's a reason why we have privacy. There's a reason why we have a uh, cash, uh, cash system. And to put extra rules on crypto because, well, I just don't trust this technology or I don't like this industry. That's no way to have policy. So, uh, and that's why you know, we're, we're, you know, we're against this bill. We're very concerned about it. Um, I, we, I, this bill definitely is not going to pass. We have the, the stop gaps in Congress to kill this bill. But I am concerned that it's a growing trend of uh, senators saying, I see all these headlines and I want to clamp down on money laundering when the reality is 0.25% of all crypto transactions are illicit versus the 4% in traditional finance. Like the parity is like, there. it's just nine day difference in terms of what the criminals prefer to use. And again, if you're a criminal trying to utilize crypto for illicit activity, you're pretty dumb, candidly. I mean, let, let, let's take the pipeline instance, for example, that happened, uh, was it last year, the ransomware attack? They found out that was Russia in less than a day because the blockchain was able to find the ransomware payment and trace and track that to Russia instantly. Chain analysis and other firms were right behind that. Uh, if you dumped a bunch of cash on the side of the street to pay off those attackers, it'd be a lot harder to trace that, uh, that cash. Obviously, we have ways to do that and through law enforcement. But I'm telling you right now, they will prefer criminals to utilize uh, the, uh, crypto and blockchain because it's really easy to track and trace. And so that's why things like mixers still don't really solve the issue. These guys get caught all the time. And that's why uh, I think we're seeing a lot more folks use the traditional financial system and not crypto. Excellent points. I, I do have to talk though about what I do believe is the trend in crypto. And I think it is a trend because it's widely recognized that in order to have 
crypto be a usable part of our financial system, you have to have privacy too. You have to have privacy measures built into the crypto, which might raise some concerns with what you just described because it wouldn't necessarily be so easy to track and trace because candidly, if I give you $5, I don't want everybody in the world to know I gave you $5. I, if I go to the store and buy some goods, I don't want everybody in the world to know where I purchased it and how much I spent and be able to track that back to my checkbook and see all of my finances, right? So we have to get to a place where we have the privacy. Exactly. And that's why I keep saying the Blockchain Association, it's parity. Cash has is, is an incredible privacy tool. We, we, we don't have, uh, you know, we don't, like to your point, we don't uh, record every single cash transaction that happens between you and me. Um, because there's an understanding that privacy uh, of cash and transactions is... Um, an invaluable right for Americans. And I think that's something that we got to make sure we preserve in this new era. That's why I love Zcash and the, everything you guys are doing is because that parity with cash is happening in the crypto ecosystem and you guys are spearheading that. Um, and it's been exciting to watch folks, I mean, Kelly on the Republican side who went from saying, you know, I'm not sure I trust cash or, uh, you know, we should go to a digital economy to, I mean, over time, the six plus years I've been in the crypto ecosystem, I've seen their view as a party evolve saying, Okay, I, I know I recognize that cash has some perks and, and benefits. I think we can bring that uh, in via technology to the next iteration of finance and crypto, and that's exactly what you guys are doing, which is really exciting. Uh, but I just want to make sure we we harp that because you know there are some folks, you know, especially the national security hawks or the defense hawks, we call them in Congress, that believe that every single transaction and in Kelly, largest folks are Republican. They say, you know what, I want to make sure that every single transaction is recorded. I want to make sure that I can see everything from everyone. If they could see every single tr cash transaction, they would happily sign up for that. And that's no way to run a society, especially here in uh, in America where we pr preserve privacy. We're not China. We believe that there should be some inherent privacy. And we've been losing that privacy right, um, especially recently, um, both in data, uh, but now in financials, uh, for quite some time. And I think it's important we take a stand saying, look, there's a reason why our founding fathers and others believe that this is important. It's not a Democrat or Republican issue. This is a rights privacy is an important thing. And we're losing a lot of it as each day goes by. And it's important we take a stand. I think we could do a whole episode on this. Well, obviously, we, we spend all of our time working on this issue of privacy. But uh, I think it's important to note that even those individuals that are concerned about national security and would like to see all the transactions, if they had that for everyone, that would be a major security vulnerability oh, for our gosh, country. Yeah. So I don't think they would like that scenario either. Of course. And like I said, crypto policy is not for the faint of heart. So uh, these are tough questions. And that's why uh, I'm excited to see, again, both sides of the aisle and members and staff engage because you get involved in this policy issue. You're not here for talking points. You're here to solve problems. These are not uh, easy problems to solve. That's for sure. Well, let's um, pivot a little bit to talk about maybe the broader political environment. It's actually been very recent that uh, the White House economic report was released and it was pretty negative on the industry. So we're getting a lot of negativity from the highest levels of government. We have talked about what we're getting from some regulators. We have bright spots in Congress, but there's also some concerns in Congress. So what do you see going forward? And, you know, Maybe just describe in your words, what do you think this environment from the broad perspective looks like and what do you hope will, it will be like in the future? Yeah, it's, um, you're not wrong. It's tough. It's been really tough recently. I think, you know, I just turned 30, uh, as I mentioned, uh, literally a month ago, and I'm thinking I've aged already a year since then because it's been a, a hell of a couple of months in crypto. Um, so from behind the scenes, what we're having is that there was skepticism from crypto to begin with. Um, and again, I think, we're seeing, you know, some Republicans are a lot more uh, open to the technologies. Uh, Democrats, maybe not as much, but I, I do still say there's a decent amount of Democrats, even back in 2017, I was working on the issue, who embraced this technology. But I think the key crux of this was FTX, unfortunately. Uh, SBF personally tr really put himself in the forefront of all things crypto policy. And towards the end, we were fighting against him, actually, um, uh, as an association on things like DeFi. He decided to screw over the entire DeFi community and applied centralized regs to DeFi exchanges. And it wasn't us solely who went against him. It was Coinbase and Kraken and like these other centralized exchanges saying, look, you're going to screw over the entire ecosystem, SBF. Why? What's your rush? What's the, the, the push so hard? 
to get this legislation done that you know is going to screw over a huge part of the crypto ecosystem. And it became apparent over the end, it was this fraud that he was trying to cover. And that's why he was pushing this so hard. But I will say, as a Hill staffer, I have never seen a, C a CEO come to Capitol Hill and Congress so much more than SBF. Not Jamie Dimon, not any of the bank CEOs. Can't leave, I don't think any CEO of his ca caliber has ever been in front of DC as much as SPF did. And that really bit the entire ecosystem in, in the rear end, unfortunately, because now a lot of the skeptics who said in the White House and Congress saying, look, I had doubts about crypto, but you know what? The SPF and the fraud that he did, that proves that's the entire ecosystem. And you and I both know that's not the case. SPF, FTX, that's there. that was fraud. That's not crypto. But the folks who were skeptics are empowered. And I think that's uh, Council of Economic Advisors report that you mentioned in March that came out. That was the uh, antithesis of, see, I told you, the, uh, for those who may not read the report, it was basically saying, it was, I think, 15 plus pages saying, crypto ecosystem says it solves this issue. But here's our truth. They're wrong. Uh, and it did that multiple point by point by point. As far as attacking blockchain technology, that's where I drew a line. I was like, okay, I'm, I deal with skeptics. It's fine. But attacking the tech, that's a whole new thing. And when they're attacking blockchain technology, that's where I was like, okay, look, th this is not serious. This is someone who has a vendetta and also is trying to say, hey, look, I'm right. Now, look, again, to his or her view, like that's, that's the, the approach I take. I don't want to, you know... Uh, you know, be just dismissive of their view. They have a, you know, they obviously sit where they are. That's important. But at the same time, the SBF saga really soured a lot of relationships here in DC. Even though we were going against SBF, I'm still facing the uh, reconciling of that, unfortunately. They, a lot of folks still view FTX as a lot of the crypto ecosystem. Um, I think Binance, unfortunately, is going to be that next thing. Uh, at least in the case of Binance, we can see that one coming like a train wreck, uh, whereas FTX is a little more sudden. Um, so hopefully the, when the buy-in situation, if that ever comes to light, uh, you know, close that chapter, I think as the ecosystem, we're going to move forward in a, in a good way. But, um, a lot of folks, at least in DC behind the scenes are waiting for that shoe to drop. And we're trying to tell folks, look, buy-ins has not been compliant. They've been trying to sketch or get around regulation for quite some time. They're very open about getting around regulation. Coinbase, for example, has been very open about engaging with regulators. And guess what? If you're Coinbase or Binance, the SEC says, you know what, I'm going to go after Coinbase. And that's been just the, you know, the it, the main crux of this whole issue for us is that the SEC sees Coinbase, who've been putting in thousands of hours of engagement, educating policymakers, 30 plus meetings with the SEC, and they're the ones who get in trouble. But Binance has done zero on all fronts and have been actually skirting regulations. They haven't gotten hit yet. And by the SEC, at least, the CFTC recently. Uh, DOJ probably soon, but at the same time, it says it doesn't matter the approach you take in DC, you're going to get hit, and that's the, that's the unfortunate uh, reality right now is that that they're trying to go after everyone, and we're pushing back as much as we can, and I think Congress has had enough. I think that that's what we saw with the Gary Gensler situation yesterday is that both sides of the aisle disagree with what, what, what he's doing, and we need to have a new day here in DC. And my hope is that that new day is pretty soon. Again, legislation is the first step for that, but candidly, we, we need to change the leadership of the SEC. Um, and I think at least with the Biden administration, I'm not saying, you know, uh, President Biden's anti-crypto or anything like that. Actually, we know President Trump was anti-crypto. Um, but I think it's important to say, look, we need to make sure we have a, a foster a good environment. We need to put the good actors in front. And if you're a bad actor, you're trying to screw regulations, look, you should be hit. And I think that's important. Um, but those who try hard to comply and meet with regulators and to find a path forward and they're u.s companies and they chose to be here let's make sure we uh, uh promote these folks and so we'll see how that dichotomy goes but uh, it's a pretty rough time unfortunately right now in dc well you just opened up a whole nother line of question for me <laughs> because that was uh some pretty charged comments that we have to talk about um all for it okay Let's talk about Binance. I personally am a little conflicted about Binance because I do know there's history there that's widely reported where they did try to avoid regulation, tried to avoid having a place that could be regulated or you know a center of control that could be regulated. But on the other hand, they're a super important part of the crypto ecosystem. They do tons of volume on their exchange globally. 
I think they probably do a lot of positive things for the ecosystem from my perspective. From what I could tell right now, I, I don't have the same expectation about Binance being revealed to be a complete fraud. I don't expect that. I think the uh, the money laundering things or uh, accusations are pretty damning. Um, you know, there's one thing I know about DC is that I think the Tornado Cash situation is actually probably the best example of this, um, where there are uh, policy outcomes that have already happened. So North Korea got funding through the nuclear program. That's happened. And there are a lot of folks in DC saying, look, we can't let that happen. That's a you know, state for uh, adversary. We got to go after them. At the same time, in the case of Tornado Cash, we have this really neat question. What is the role of Mixer? You know, especially with someone who created but walked away, there's a question of, well, as coach speech here, is this protected by the First Amendment? Um, and for the folks over in the national security side of things, they say, I don't care, you know, what it was utilized. I'm not sure I care about the First Amendment. All I know is I see North Korea getting money, money from the nuclear program. And my job as a national security person is to shut that down. And I can't go to North Korea to shut down their program. So I'm going to find someone who facilitated that or something that facilitated that and go after them and make an example of them. And that's what Tornado Cash was. No, so so the national security folks think they're in the right to do that. But from us, from our perspective, it's saying, look, I, that's a violation in our view. That's a violation of the First Amendment. Here's someone who's, I mean, literally a, a, a kid who made this code, walked away, and now he's arrested and being held liable um, for North Korea utilizing their code, which he had no intention of North Korea utilizing their code. He made a code, walked away, and a bad actor twisted it for their own nefarious purposes. And I think that's the issue with D.C., where D.C. has this view, especially this one wing of D.C. in the national security perspective. But also on our end, we're saying, look, I, the bad actors are always going to break the law. They're always going to try to find ways to obscure good purposes for their own nefarious purposes. Um, so there's a balance here. And I think we we went way too overboard here by pr prosecuting North, the uh, Tornado Cash situation. But at the same time, I think there's folks who look at Biden saying, look, there's, they're facilitate Iran uh, securing sanctions. And that national security wing is going to go after Binance. The only difference this time is that Binance is explicit is, uh, in some reports, giving them the middle finger and saying, "Yeah, what are you going to do about it?" And that's where it's it gets a little uh, dicey in terms of, well, you guys can't say you were unaware of that situation. So, I, and I think there's also a lot of folks like the CFTC who say there's no compliance program there. That's a concerning thing. So, um, so it remains to be seen exactly how that will play out, but. That, that's kind of the dichotomy in DC is that we talked about balancing out when it comes to stable coins, but there's also a balancing out when it comes to national security policy and crypto. And I think that's still being played out with the Tornado Cash situation. And I think we'll see that playing out with the Binance situation soon enough. So it's possible that good actors, the ones that we perceive as good actors like Coinbase, may be pushed out of the country. In fact, haven't they suggested they might move out of the country? They said it yesterday. The CEO said he was in DC, said it's... If I am trying to do whatever I can to comply with the SEC, and at the same time they're saying, thank you very much, but guess what? You're going to get sued. That's no way to re regulate an industry, let alone a business who has come to them hat in hand saying, we want to work with you. And there's no, uh, there's been what, the nine months at one point that they had no communication with the SEC? It wasn't Coinbase who uh, wasn't responding, it was the SEC. The Coinbase said, look, we want to talk to you, we want to have conversations. The SEC said, SEC said nothing. So what do you do? Uh, it's a really tough situation. Do you pay that fine? Do you cut employees further? Do you cut back your business model? It's uh, it's a really unfortunate situation. So, uh, whereas at the same time, it's not like they're going to shady countries to domicile. They're going to the EU. They're going to Singapore. They're going to UK. They're going to legitimate G7 nations. Uh, and that's very telling of what good actors do. They go to very well-regulated countries where at the same time we have FTX in the Bahamas he was domiciled there for a reason, because they got they were able to uh, a get away from U.S. purview, but also b say um, you know we can go to a Bahamian regulator who can probably strong arm us in terms to uh, you know getting funds back at the last second when they're bankrupt technically. Uh, but at the same time, we had the uh, I think this line of question happened against her saying, "Hey, look, you want to bring these companies in, you want to regulate them, but everything you're doing is pushing them offshore where you can't regulate them." So what, like, what's your approach here? Like, you're not really having a, a, a conversation or, a, or facilitating a situation where you can have them in front of you uh, and being, you can then have good direct purview over them. You're forcing them elsewhere. And then when they fall, you say, well, it wasn't our fault. It was your fault. You forced them offshore. You didn't look at their books. And here we are.
Wow. Okay. Well, a lot of lessons there. Hopefully we will learn from some of those situations. We can hope. And hope for the good actors to prevail. Let's uh, change course a little bit as we wrap up or get close to wrapping up. I know that um, you work closely with the members, and I have heard that you're actually starting to work even more closely with some members on the government relations coordination. And I'd like to hear like how you expect to, to do that and what how you're going to work with your members. Maybe you could then give us some advice to the members on what you'd like to see them do. And then also just for those who are not members, like maybe share some advice on how you think the whole ecosystem should work together, whether they're members or not. I think that's the best thing about crypto is that, you know, we are all in this together. Um, and I think that's the my favorite part of this whole place is that we, we communicate um, on Twitter, we communicate on Signal and Telegram, we share information quickly, we act fast, and it's a very dynamic system. I mean, lobbying and, and policy, it's it's pretty slow in most cases. My friends who work in, in banking lobbying, which, uh, you know, when I came to the Hill in 2015, I thought that was a pinnacle of anyone's lobbying careers to be a bank lobbyist. And now my friends who are, hill, uh, you know, either on the Hill or have voted in or lobbying are saying the bank lobbying is so boring. I want to be in crypto. Crypto is exciting, fast. Sure, am I, are there bags in my eyes? Am I tired? Yes. But I love it because it's exciting and it's dynamic and it's never boring and it's never the same. And every day there's a new issue, um, for better or for worse. And so the good thing about at least our coordination now is that we're bringing folks together saying, you know, bring your expertise, bring your stories, bring... Um, uh, your elements, you know, I need, when it comes to policymaker education, visuals, good stories, um, concrete examples, uh, you know, everyone brings something to the table that uh, is a strength that is really uh, important. You know, every member of Congress, every staffer, they operate differently. They listen to different stories. Um, you know, there's a typical r routine of lo lobbying and engagement with the Hill. That's, you know, you find someone in the district, you bring them there, you, you do the whole meeting, you bring a bunch of constituents, you follow up six months later and it's a very routine situation that's not in crypto because it is a live fire drill every single time and everyone has a value add so um first off i say you know members are not the blockchain association i always communicate with folks uh, and i'm always happy to share intel and or and to share you know my perspective of the current situation so always be happy to reach out always feel free to uh to um, ping me anytime i'm always happy to be a resource because we're all in this together um and then at the same time too if you're having issues, let us know. I think, you know, we had some uh, issues with folks getting debanked recently. I think mostly that's been resolved, uh, thankfully, in the past couple uh, of days. But, you know, if folks are having issues getting bank accounts, for example, or you're being denied, or if a bank says, hey, a regulator told us to deny crypto companies, let us know. We are here to help out. You don't have to be a member of the Blockchain Association to tell your story. We have an open line, uh, uh, tip line for that. So, and we share those tips with congressional uh, offices on the Democrat and Republican side of the aisle because um, being debanked for being crypto is wrong and illegal. So both sides of the aisle care about that issue. Um, so I think it's really important. So so we're going to be doing uh, you know more com uh, coordination with uh, our own internally. We have 105 plus companies now, but um, I always tell folks um, who are not a membership, we still coordinate with them all the time. Uh, and like I said, we're all in this together. Uh, and it's funny because sometimes we have strange bedfellows. Sometimes we're against the banks. Um, sometimes the banks uh, are with us. It really depends the issue area and the issue that's at hand. But um, I always take the approach, the bigger the tent, uh, the more unique voices we can have. And everyone has a good story to tell. So let's utilize that story and find the right uh, person on Capitol Hill that will resonate with that. That, I think, is a good way to wrap up. I have to say, though, that this has been such a pleasure. And What's interesting about what you do is that it's going to be completely different in six months. So you're going to have six to months probably, honestly. So let's be honest. Perhaps. We're, we're going to need more updates as the bottom line. So I invite you to come back at some point in the future when we have time to just go over everything again and give all of our listeners an update on what's happening on Capitol Hill. We'll keep doing the great work you guys are doing. So I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Ron. Thanks again.